<clears throat> I am uh, the uh, sermon that's listed in the in the bulletin is not the sermon I'm preaching this morning. In fact, um, I think that Deanie stole my notes. It's an inside joke. That's why she's laughing so hard. So um, let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning uh, we truly do rely on you. And as the story was told for the children about the boys who cried out for protection, for guidance, for, uh, to cover them, we pray that your spirit would cover us today. We ask that you give us the faith of those two little boys to know that when we pray that you're here, you answer, that uh, you're still in control. We thank you so much for your love. And Lord, please love us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> AD 64 uh, was a rough time in politics in Rome. <clears throat> there was a crazy emperor by the name of Nero who was literally crazy, and he started a fire and it started to burn the city of Rome. But he didn't want to take accountability for it, so he blamed the Christians. And it started the first persecution of Christians. Up until that time, the Christians had lived pretty much in harmony and not a whole lot of abuse, except for maybe the Jews, but not from the Roman authorities. But now Nero turned his attention on the Christians as being the scapegoat for the burning of the city. There was a man by the name of Paul who was in the city at the time, in the maritime prison. Now, if you've ever visited Rome, the maritime prison is still intact. It is still pretty much the same as it was in A.D. 62. And you can go and visit it, and you can go down inside. And it's kind of a unique place. I was there. I actually, if I would have been prepared, I'd have showed you pictures. We took a group of pastors, and we went down there, and we had communion in the prison, the very place that Paul had been held. It is literally like a sewer. There is a round uh, grate that goes over and the prisoners were dropped into this pit. And of course, they had built a, a stairway where we could walk down, but that was not there when Paul was there. They were literally just dropped into a pit in the floor. It was interesting when we were there how somber it was as we stood there and tried to envision what it was like for Paul to be in this prison. Now, Paul was in prison twice in Rome. The first time, he was allowed to stay in a private residence. It really wasn't a prison like we understand it. He just had to, it was kind of like probation. He had to stay at this place and knew where he was, and he had to come for his trial. But, but Paul was released from that first one, and he went on and continued his ministry. But after Nero, he was captured again, and this time he was thrown into maritime prison. In fact, Peter would shortly be thrown into the prison for, with him, or if not with him, near the same time, in the same place, and both of them would never leave the prison. They would both be executed in a very short time. Nero believed that if he could get rid of the leaders of this movement, that he could destroy Christianity, something that's gone on throughout time. We've seen this before, where people have decided if they could take out leaders, they could destroy the movement, but it's never worked. Christianity has always gotten stronger. It has always survived these kinds of things. And even with Peter and Paul being killed, Christianity flourished. But there's always been leaders who have stood up and taken the place of these great people who have been strong in the faith. <clears throat> Today I want to take a look at 2 Timothy. So if you've got your Bibles or your electronic devices, I want you to open up. We're going to be reading a good portion of 2 Timothy, but I wanted you to understand the context. 2 Timothy was written while Paul was in the maritime, uh, maritime prison, and it was, many believe it was his last, well, they, we know it was his last epistle that was written, but many believe it was kind of his last will and testament. It was kind of Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy was a young man that Paul had taken under his wings to mentor and to teach how to be a spiritual leader in the church. It was kind of like, you know, Paul knew he was going to die. In fact, he mentions this in the book of Timothy. He knows that his time is short. And as you read this in the context of the completeness of 2 Timothy, you get this picture 
that Paul had a short time and he had some very important things that he wanted to share. Now, we're, I'm going to read 2 Timothy, but I want you to understand it in the context of Paul's mindset, the situation that he was in when he wrote it, and what he was hoping to achieve by writing this for his protege, his, this young man that Paul had poured a lot of time and energy into that would soon be the new leadership of the church when he was taken out of the picture. Some of it's very personal to Timothy, but a lot of these letters that Paul wrote were read to the churches. In fact, this was kind of the sermons of the day, is that a letter that would come from Paul or Peter or John would be read to the congregation as a sermon. So the first time that this letter was sent to, to Timothy, I'm certain that Timothy stood up in front of the people that he was serving, and he wrote this saying, this is coming from my mentor, this is coming from Paul, the one who's kind of started this movement. I'm going to start in 2 Timothy verse three, chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I pray constantly, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, Timothy, so that I might be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphus, Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which, I am being for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. 
Do your best to present yourself at, to God as one approved, a workman, who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some are for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Nah, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Terrible times? Give me a break. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into the homes and gain control over weak-willed women, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected, but they will not get very far, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, my son Timothy, Know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, I Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. How many of you re remember the sermon I did a year ago on what Paul looks like? How many of you remember the beatings that Paul took, the stonings that Paul took? that he was a man who took extreme abuse for what he taught and what he preached. Paul's reminding Timothy of that. Your lot as a, as a leader in this church is not going to be easy, he said to Timothy. You have seen it in me, and it will happen in you. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How many of you have been persecuted lately? Maybe we're not living a godly... Oh, I wouldn't suggest that at all. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as far as you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. When Paul wrote this, how much of the New Testament had been written? None of it. So Paul, when he says all Scripture, was talking about what? The Old Testament. But we as modern Christians, we don't believe the Old Testament is for us, right? We're New Testament Christians. So Paul obviously was referring to something else, right? All Scripture is useful for teaching and rebuking, for correcting, con co uh, training in righteousness. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, now I want you to understand where I'm going with this. You see, I know very few preachers who have been ordained that have not been preached from this very text in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
My own ordination service by Don Schneider almost 20 years ago, Don preached from 2 Timothy chapter 4. So I want you to hear this. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, and do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. Paul knew he was going to die soon. He had not been sentenced yet, but he knew he wasn't leaving that prison. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul goes on to make some personal remarks to some people that he knew, said, say hi to so-and-so. Paul's last will and testament to Timothy. Be faithful, young man. You have seen my ministry. You know what I have endured. You know what I've taught. And you know what that teaching has done. It has created controversy everywhere that I went. Timothy, you now are being called to take my place. I'm not going on any further. And I have been at a number of ordinations where we have been preached and talked to and, and encouraged to take this charge as preachers, as faithful ministers of the gospel, preach the word. Preach the word. I served 17 years in ministry before I came here, and I never had a single person tell me what I can or cannot preach. I never had a single person tell me that I was going off script until I came here. And now I am being encouraged to not preach certain things and to preach certain things, and I don't know what to do with that. Because I have always believed that if I have faithfully read my scripture, if I have prayed to God and asked him to give me clearance, to give me guidance, to give me clarity of thought, that he would guide me. Am I perfect? No. And there are times that people have said to me after the service, you made a mistake, and I said, okay, well, point it out to me, and I'll go back and I'll study it, and I'll come back and I will figure it out. But my heart is to do what Paul encouraged Timothy to do, to be a faithful preacher of the gospel to be a faithful teacher of the Bible. But sometimes it rubs people the wrong way. And I'm sorry for that. I am sorry. And I do not mean to hurt you. I do not mean to offend. I do not mean to cause you to, to engage in fear. But you know that we have an administration today in this country that refuses to call sin, sin. An administration who refuses to call terrorism, terrorism, and he thinks that if I refuse to acknowledge it, if I don't talk about it, it'll go away. And that there won't be pain and suffering and people won't get shot. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. And people are dying. And we have a politically correct system that has decided we can't call terrorism, terrorism. And we can't call sin, sin. And we've redefined marriages, we've redefined relationships, we've redefined everything in this country that goes against what we have traditionally believed that God is calling us as a people to believe. <clears throat> when I was 18, I was a patriot. I believed in what this country stood for. It was the height of the Vietnam War, and I remember a lot of people being anti-war protesters. And I remember, and you can, re you guys, come on, make love, not war. Give peace a chance. Let's just avoid conflict. Let's smoke dope, 
drink alcohol, party out in a, a, a field in New York, sing, and the war will go away. I marched down to the local recruiting center and I joined because I believed in what this country stood for. My father had served in World War II along with three of his brothers. My brother had joined the army and was in Vietnam at this time. And I was a patriot. That was more than 40 years ago. I'm not sure I'm a patriot anymore because I don't know this country that we live in. I don't understand where we're going as a nation. And sometimes I feel the same way about the church. I don't know where we're going. It's not the church that I grew up in, or it's not the church that I was indoctrinated into. How do we get there? How do we get back to that? I don't know if we'll ever get back to that in this country. I know Trump says, oh, let's make this nation great again. I'm not sure he has the blueprint for it. But what has happened to us as a nation? Have we turned our cheek the other way and we've just avoided looking at things? And I, I really don't want to make this a political discussion, but things are happening in our world around us and we've got to wake up. We have got to wake up. Things are happening all around us and not talking about it doesn't change it. The reality is, is that there is an enemy today who hates God's people and he is doing whatever he can to destroy us and not talking about it and avoiding it doesn't make it go away. I don't want that to happen to me, my family, or my church. I want to stand up for Jesus Christ and the truth. Now, as Paul talks to Timothy, he intimates that we can know the truth. We don't have to be like, like uh, Pilate when he said to Jesus, what is truth? How can we know truth? That's, that's Greek philosophy. We can't know truth. But Jesus said you can know the truth. And Paul, in talking to Timothy in this book, said you can know the truth. And you can rightly divide Scripture. And you can understand what God is trying to tell you. So for some today in the church, we're throwing everything out and saying, well, we can't really understand this. How do we know what God wants? How Get on your knees and ask him, and maybe he'll tell you. Get in the Word and read it, and he will guide you into all truth. But it requires that we stop pretending that there's nothing wrong. That there isn't a war out there, a spiritual battle being fought for the lives of our children and our neighbors. And if you want to know what really, really, really irks me, is that none of my family are converted and believe in Jesus Christ. And a lot of friends that I have are not converted. And sometimes it seems like we, the church, don't care too much about my people, those of us who used to live on the other side, those of us who grew up in a world of sin and rejection of Jesus Christ. And if there's one thing that really irks me about my church is that we've lost the sight of caring for lost people caring to the point of sacrificially living for them. One last thing, and I'm going to end. I want you to know this. I don't know if it makes any difference at all. But do you know the difference between a leader and a manager? A manager tries to keep the status quo. A manager tries to grease the wheels and keep the system working. A manager is not about change. It's about stasis. You know what a leader is about? It's about taking you to places you've never been before. A leader is about challenging the status quo. I have always been a leader, whether it was in business, before I became a Christian, or when I became a pastor. And I have always made people uncomfortable because I've always asked the question, why not? Let's try something different. Let's move. Let's stop sitting on our hands and let's do something. That's my personality. Maybe I could change it. I don't know. 
but I would like to be a part of leading this church to something that God is calling us to be. I really would. And I'd like for us to get excited about that. Not status quo, but God has something in store for this church that we have not even begun to scratch the surface on. And I would love to be a part of that kind of work. So I'm going to end with prayer, since we didn't have it before, and, we, and I'm thinking this is a God thing, that we didn't have a person to do prayer. And I would like you to pray with me and pray for me. And pray for this church, and not necessarily Palisadro, but the Seventh-day Adventist church, the Christian church in general. That we stop arguing over minutia and we get serious about what God is calling us to become. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, I uh, want to ask you this morning that you would uh, help us to hear your voice. Frequently we pray for the Holy Spirit, the, Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but Lord, I'm not sure we know what we're praying for because the Holy Spirit is a mover and a shaker. And I want to be moved and shaken. I want to be taken off my comfort zone and I want to go where you lead. Father, I don't know what you have in store for me personally or for us corporately, but I want to be willing to hear your voice and to follow you no matter where you go. Lord, I want to be able to honestly share the truth of the gospel to the best of my ability according to your guiding and leading. And I ask for that, Father. I humbly ask that you would lead me, that you would take the human element out of me, the stubborn German out of me, and let me be a learner at the feet of Jesus. And I pray that you'd give me a spirit of kindness, but determination. I pray, Father, that we as a congregation will be moved off of our comfort zone to a new comfort zone that fully trusts in you, that allows you to lead and guide and take us where you want us to go. And I pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to the hurting and suffering that are in this congregation that sometimes slip below the surface. We have people who aren't coming to church because their families are imploding. And they're too ashamed to come to church for fear of judgmentalism. Father, teach us how to reach out to them and to love them. <clears throat> Father, we have marriages that are exploding right now. And there's a lot of pain and suffering. Teach us how to reach out and minister to those who are hurting. We have children, Father, who are struggling. Give us eyes to see them. Give us the ability to reach out our hands and to do something for these young people. They live in a world that many of us older folk don't understand. They are growing up in, in a way that we have never experienced before in the history of this world. They are being bombarded by images through the internet and computers that are things that we never knew of when we were children. And they're not all good. They're seeing violence and sex in so many ways that they're becoming immune to it. And I pray, I seriously pray for these young people, Father. <clears throat> I fear what's ahead of them. I pray, Father, that you would hurry and come soon. This world is getting ugly fast. There's a lot of death and carnage, people hurting people. And Lord, I, uh, I get tired of doing funerals, hospital visitations, getting calls about cancer. I ask, Father, that you'd make it stop. And the only way it's going to stop is if you intervene. So please come quickly. But please prepare us, Father. 
please prepare us for that time. Lord, I want to thank you that you have called us into your family. I want to thank you that you have loved us beyond measure. And that even in our own ignorance and, and in our own inability, you still lift us up. That you still call us your children. And I'm so grateful for that. Lord, I pray for each person who is here and who is not here, that we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we seek that voice, and we allow it to transform us, to make us new people. May Jesus be glorified in our lives, in our church, in our families, and in our neighborhoods. This isn't really about us, this is about you, Father. And let's turn the direction of the discussion back to you. Father, bless us in spite of ourselves. Bless us because of Jesus. And may your will be done. We pray in his precious name. Amen.